Live hackers. Today is the first episode when I really needed to add an intro. It, it's just absolutely compulsory because my guest, Dr. Edith Eva Eager, she's an Auschwitz survivor and thriver. And last month when we recorded the episode, uh, she was 92, which is a lot. And that means that her history lasts for almost a century already. She got into Auschwitz when she was 16. And um, her parents, unfortunately, died the same day they got into the camp. Not died, they were killed in the gas chambers. But happily, she and her sister Magda, they survived. On the last day when the Soviet troops entered the concentration camp, she was found in the pile of dead bodies. Literally a pile of dead bodies. Barely alive. Mostly bones and just some skin. It took her a long time to recover physically, but then it took her much longer to recover mentally. One of the biggest things she experienced was the guilt of the survivor. When she just got into the camp, she was kind of welcomed or met by Dr. Mengele, who is called the Angel of Death, and uh, he asked her whether, and at that moment he was pointing at her mother, he asked whether she's her sister, mother. And since there was a certain age limit within which the Nazis considered people kind of valid, she, her mother, she immediately was killed when she said that it's Edith true. Edith Eva Eager was preparing to become a competitor at the Olympics from Hungary as she was really good in gymnastics but when all the events started happening in Europe that preceded World War II she was expelled from the national team because uh, yeah, of her Jewish descent but she's still dancing which you will learn from the interview and um, after World War II she got married and um, since communists were coming to power in the eastern part of Europe, she and her husband and their baby, little baby, they had to run to US. They left just everything and they started their life from scratch in in United States of America, which wasn't easy. But in 1969, Edith has finally received her PhD in uh, clinical psychology and um, the rest will be learned from the interview and also you can read in her amazing book which I really advise to read just to anybody but yeah she became a well-known psychiatrist she has been to opera show not once um, but also she was invited to present her book last year, she went and uh, talked on CNN, she met Larry King, so she's a kind of a star of the psychology world and the world where you can make a choice, when you can decide whether your past is a liability or this is your power, this is your strength. So, just after intro, please meet Dr. Edith Eager. Hello. Dr. Eager, hello. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Nazdravia. <laughs> yeah, this is Russian. Yes, right? Nazdravia. No, 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 I don't. Uh, <laughs> no. Just a short one. Dr. Eager. Thank you very much for finding time to talk to me. I am so happy to see a, such a handsome young man interviewing me. 
Thank you. Thank it's you. such an honor. <laughs> okay, I, I think I'm ready. <laughs> I was kind of anxious to meet you in person because uh, I, I am like three times younger than you are. What, what, what can I actually ask you in the sense that you went through so much already? How to have joy and passion in life. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Get, get rid of your anger and hate. That's also good. Self-love is self-care. That's the <laughs> only one you're going to have for a lifetime. So I want to be a good role model to you and your family and everyone in the world. We have to unite. We have to. <sighs> My first question is something that I guess only you can share. You have seen many generations coming and going through the time from World War II. And I'm wondering, how do you see this world? Is it, is it good? Is it a good place? Or is it a hard place for people to, to be in? Do you know that children need to know that the world is a safe place and the facts are friendly? So I am going to really let you know how important it is for us to unite and empower each other with our differences. That you can be you and I can be I, but together we're going to be much, much better off than me alone or you alone. So we have to really, truly accept one another without criticism and judgment and uh, have a world that we hold hand in hand and create a human family that we can survive finally on this planet. That's my dream, just like Martin Luther King. And I, uh, I was fortunate enough to march with him. Uh, you didn't say this in the book. I did not say it in a book. That's too bad. Maybe it's in my second book. I, have I don't know if it's in the second book either. The second book is now with the publisher. She's finished with it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was with him in Washington, um, 1963. There were three people singing, the mamas and the papas. Maybe you can hear those people sing lovely lovely millions of people were there and and i got a hug and then so i'm very fortunate to let you know that uh, i am uh, doing everything in my power so we can remove prejudice and uh, i am very happy to talk to you I'm not going to finish it because it's not, you know how to finish it. I'm not going to say that word. Okay. I actually didn't know this song, but I, I, I got the, the ending. I, I understand how it should finish. There you go. See, I, I love the Russians because they liberated us. Um, Auschwitz was liberated by the Russians. I, I was liberated by the American GIs, May 4, 1945. See what happened that the Russians liberated uh, um, Poland. Poland and uh, the Americans liberated uh, Austria. So mm -hmm. that's how they, they divided who's gonna go where. And uh, so I learned Russian and uh, <laughs> I lived in a place called Kosice, Czechoslovakia and the Russians took over. And they came to my house and played the piano and sang songs like that one. So uh, <laughs> we have something in common. Maybe your great grandfather was the one who was in my city in 1945. Dr. Eager, um, last year I, uh, for the first time in my life, uh, I read the book by Viktor Frankl. Yes. And 
on my episode, I decided to share my feelings because it touched me so much. And I was thinking that it would be great to talk to him, but I mean, he, 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 he's long gone. And uh, this, I, at the end of the last year, I received a message from your publisher that your book is coming out and I just found about it and I read it. And um, I loved it and I would like to share why I loved it very much. Um, because um, you free people, but you're also very alive in this book you are sharing your emotions like i was captivated i was crying with you when you reunited with your husband the second time he uh, proposed to you i was worried about you when you were going to his prison to buy him out uh, with the ring i was going through all these emotions so i was kind of reliving everything with you thank you because energy in motion is uh is what's happening uh, my book is a female voice of victor franco but i'm not victor franco because he was an md a medical doctor in auschwitz when i was a 16 year old in love a very different mentality but we both used the same skills how to pretend and imagine that we were somewhere else so we were able to check out and when he was checking out he pretended that he's in vienna giving a lecture about the psychology of the concentration camp and i told him when i was dancing for dr mengele i pretended that i the music was tchaikovsky and i was dancing the romeo and juliet at the Budapest Opera House. Very different way of uh, thinking because I was in love and I wanted to see my boyfriend because he told me I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands. So I said to myself, if I survive today, then tomorrow I'll be free. So I never ever allowed myself not to give up hope. Can I ask you about this? When the next day came and you still wouldn't meet him. Yes. Yes, it was hope that was taking you from one day to another. But at the same time, was it ever heartbreaking that this didn't like kind of fulfill, this didn't realize? It was really one day at a time. I kept saying, if I survive today, then tomorrow I'm going to see my boyfriend. That tomorrow became really my good friend that I would say, well, let me see what I can do today so I can make it. And, uh, but was also very curious, what's going to happen next? So I never really imagined that I will ever give up. So I just thought it's temporary and I can survive it. And today I tell you that too, and my patients, that whatever you are going through, it's temporary and you can survive it. That you become your best encourager. And I'm going to be a best encourager to you because you are the future. You're gonna be the president. <laughs> you have to think big. And you're a very brilliant journalist now. Really, truly, you are, you are. So you have to really say thank you to your ancestors who didn't have it as good as you do and they never gave up and you carry that blood. Good survivors never give up. That's true. Your mother was gone when she was 40 and um, I started growing through my family history and uh, my grandmother, she, she's, uh, she went through hunger in Ukraine when there was no food because it was all exported to US and to Europe. And it was like an artificial hunger in the country. So basically in her childhood, uh, she had like beetroot leaves. That's what they had, not, not, not much for a longer period of time. And um, when I was growing, one of the ways for her to express love was to feed me, to give me food. 
it was like uh, the main thing and um i remember thinking that sometimes she was angry to me and um when i was a kid but yesterday i was reflecting on this again i thought wow she lost her mother her mother was like 18 and uh, she was four she has never had childhood and you're sharing this in your book about your sisters as well that they never had childhood your uh, elder sister she became a, a violinist a, a player yeah. on the violin and uh -huh. she it, it amazed me I, I just thought but that's also true about her my grandmother never had her <laughs> childhood and she had all the right to feel whatever she felt but still i was there and my mother brought me to this world so in this way it is very life assuring what you're writing and what you're sharing are you still dancing i have been dancing uh, even now i am uh, having a boyfriend and we dance the boogie boogie the it's the big band glenn miller tommy dorsey way before you were born i dance the swing when you move when you dance where does it take you in your mind in your spirit i i always dance i work with couples and i teach them how not how not to really criticize each other and not to get out of step you know sometimes you marry someone who is your complete opposite and then you try to change each other so i'm always doing my choreography with couples uh, i'm dancing all the time and even in auschwitz when i was asleep i was dreaming about dancing and um, i think the dance is my life and uh, the rhythm of the dancing is very much every day happening in my office teaching people how not to get out of step and how to keep communications open that's the only way you're going to have peace in the world is when we open up communications victim victims and victimizers yesterday's victims can easily become today's victimizer because part of the psyche identifies with the aggressor. See, the victim is weak and the victimizer is strong. So part of the psyche easily, easily will be with you. And what happens that the victims become the victimizers. I like mm -hmm. to really say that that doesn't happen because many survivors didn't really do their grief work and uh, it takes grieving and healing uh, for me to talk to you that i'm still doing myself forgiving myself that i survived i had tremendous tremendous survivor's guilt so when i graduated with honors i didn't show up for my graduation because they were dead and I was alive and I didn't even allow myself to celebrate that I graduated with honors. So the biggest enemy, you have to look at you, that you find the Hitler in every one of us. And so is love, Mother Teresa, and so it's what we choose. I choose, hopefully, to let you know that you're born with love and joy we learn to hate we learn to judge we learn to say us and them i'm good you're bad i'm right you're wrong and so i'm teaching actually people how to talk to themselves to become good parent to you so i ask when did your childhood end because some children have to take care of parents and they grow up very fast and the other question i ask would you like to be married to you he's married you're married <laughs> <laughs> do you adore your wife uh my inner wife or the outer wife that i have um, is your wife I, working yes yeah, she's working she she actually works with people she has been working with people for most of her life. She had 
her own traumas and then she came out of them and now she works with people too. You have Doctor, children? One girl, Thea. I would say that yeah. my wife and then she are my greatest teachers. I mean, I'm le learning a lot about myself because I was the only child in the family and I lived on my own for quite some time and uh, becoming a father and becoming a husband is like the whole journey in itself. Never raise your voice. Your child has to really be looking how you adore her mother. Because love is not what you feel, it's what you do. Um, what would be the first steps to not victimize myself or oneself? What are the first steps to become friends and to become a lover with myself? You have to ask yourself before you say anything, is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it very important? And if it's not, don't say it. You say to yourself, is this the best I can do? Okay, you can do better than criticizing. You know, you're, you're not here to criticize anyone because what you don't like in somebody else, you have to look at that in you. That's important that you do not put yourself down. You do the best you can that is humanly possible. And this is very important because the way you talk to yourself changes your body chemistry. That is science, really. So when you get up in the morning, look in the mirror and say, I love you, Dimitri. Yes, <laughs> that's what you do. It's not narcissistic. That's a difference. But you become a good friend to you, that you have your body, your mind, and your spirit in congruency. They click together. The way you talk to yourself in the morning can make or break your day. When you say, I always do that, I never will do that, those are dead-end words. It's absolutistic. Just say, up till now I did that, and now I'm going to do something else. Or in the past, I did that, that you learn from history, so you would not, God forbid, repeat it. And that's what I am totally committed to. So your children will never experience, your grandchildren, ever what I did. Because never in a history of mankind such a scientific and systematic annihilation of people existed. I am part of the final solution when 15 highly educated people decided at the end of the day that they can put 30,000 Jews in the oven in one day. So that's why it's not comparable. We still have genocide. You know, I'm taking care of a wonderful woman uh, who experienced the genocide in Rwanda. Her mother was raped and killed in front of her. So you see, um, it's not comparable, but unfortunately, we still have genocide as we speak. I like to do something about that and be the ambassador for peace and that gives me purpose in my life. And Viktor Frankl was my colleague, my wonderful mentor, and I did the 90, he was 90 when I gave the keynote address for him. So without him, I really wouldn't be where I am now. He helped me with his book to also write my own book. But I'm not Viktor Franco. There is only one of those. And uh, he was truly the one who gave me the words how to really tell people what can happen when good people do 
what they do. So you are hopefully going to start maybe a way that people can get together in a group because the opposite of depression is expression. What comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. And I never told anyone I was in Auschwitz for at least 20 years in America. I just wanted to be a Yankee doodle dandy. <laughs> and I didn't want to speak with an accent. So you see, I speak with an accent and I'm okay now. I accept that. And I will tell everybody what can happen because I'm 92 now. So I travel everywhere and see how we can unite and get rid of the us and them mentality. There was this uh, short dialogue in your book with the principal of the school where you worked uh, when you told him, I, I think you told him or her, I'm sorry if I'm mistaken, that you wanted to actually work with people, but you're gonna be like 50 when you're gonna finish your education. And he said that you're gonna be 50 anyways which I loved because that's true. <laughs> we're gonna be what we're gonna be anyway, but then we do not miss this opportunity. I sent this quote to my parents and to my parents' parents because they loved it so much. See, when you're angry, you're hurting, not the other person. So if I would be angry and hate today, I would still be a prisoner. Are you familiar with Ivan Ilyich? Uh, uh, I think it's Tolstoy uh, or Chekhov, one of those. And he was he was dying, and he realized that his whole life was meaningless, that he didn't like what he did. And I think it's a very good piece of literature. So when I'm in my deathbed, I'm gonna feel very happy that I talked <laughs> to you and what I gave uh, to the world, not feeling victim. I'm not a victim. I was victimized. It's not who I am. It's what was done to me. That's important. I have a story, but I'm not my story. Mm -hmm. See? I think it's very important not to, not to really see yourself as a victim because you never are a victim unless you have a victimizer. See, when you are a victim, I can blame everybody all the time. That means I get a license to do nothing. So it's very important um, not to really blame because while you blame, you're still a prisoner. Actually, children blame. When people blame, even if they're 30 or 40 or 80, I know I'm talking to a child. It's good to be childlike, but not childish. What is the best way to teach a child um, to take responsibility for his thoughts and his emotions and actions? It's very important to treat the child and recognize that the, that the brain is growing and it has to be uh, the age appropriate way you you talk. When a child is two years old, we talk about the negative twos. I want, I need, I gotta have, you're not gonna make me, I'm not gonna, you see, when you're two. The three, we talk about the trusting three. And your child is four? Yes. So you just talk to a four-year-old? in a 40 year old way, always loving. Watch the tone of your voice. Don't ask how are you, because they'll say fine. It's better to say, uh, I'm so happy to be with you and spend time with you. And you go and play the game that your child likes, even though it's boring to you, but but you have to meet the child where they are and uh, 
you don't use any big words. Like I am never gonna say to a four-year-old that you have cognitive dissonance. They, they don't know that language. But I'm gonna talk to you about cognitive dissonance. Uh, for the four-year-old, I'm going to say, sounds like you're angry about it. You say, I want that toy. And you say, meet the child and give the child permission. That's a very good word. To feel the feeling. Just all you have to say, sounds like you said about it, glad about it, okay? Angry about it. There are not too many feelings. Don't try to understand. A four-year-old doesn't know that word, understand. They don't know logic until they're eight years old. Okay, so it has to be age appropriate. Now, there is a wonderful book, actually, it's called How to Talk to Kids So They Would Listen and How to Listen So They Would Talk. So you can just repeat so the child knows that you hear her. And don't preach, why don't you do this? Or why don't you, or let's do that. Don't be so bossy. Just go down to the level of a 40-year-old and uh, do what she wants to do for 20 minutes and read, read, read as much to the child as you can. Books are so important that not television and sitting there like a dummy, but to really be active, be active. Because love is time, T-I-M-E, time. I want to tell you that the best thing for a child is a happy marriage because they watch you. They watch you, the way you relate to each other, that when you fight with each other, your child gets very scared because the biggest fear of a child is the fear of abandonment. So be, be sure that you never yell and raise your voice, that you communicate with your wife knowing that your child is learning from you how to love and how to have joy in a family. That you're not a victim, you're not the victimizer, and that can happen a lot of the times in family. When you have a persecutor, a rescuer, and a victim, and all three play all three roles, that's, that's the dynamic that came from a guy called Karpman that I studied. And it happens a lot of the times when you have three, mother, father, and a child, and they all become either perpetrators or the rescuers or the victim. So if, if, if your wife tells your daughter to go to your room, you don't come with the ice cream cone and, and see how we, can, how we can tame that bitch, your mother. You have to be really careful of that. It can happen because daddies want to be always the nice guys. <laughs> Santa Claus. <laughs> you have to be on the same page with your wife. I hope I am. At least I'm. I'm doing my best. I think. I think I was a victimizer, but I'm doing my best to get out of that, and to not uh, do anything of that kind. Never screaming on her, really, but like trying to do it in softer ways, but not less painful, though. But I, I totally agree with you. I think it's important for me to tell you that in Auschwitz. If you were only for the me, you didn't make it. We had a family that we had to care about each other because all we had was each other then. So when I was having my bread and my soup in the evening, I ate the soup and I saved the bread because my sister suffered more from hunger than I did. And when I danced for Dr. Mengele and he gave me a piece of bread, I shared it with the girls that I was 
and later on, later on when I was in a death march from Mauthausen to Bunskirchen, I was about to stop. And when you stopped, you were shot right away. I, I revisited that place myself, every place I was. And you know, the girls that I shared the bread with formed a chair with their arms and they carried me so I wouldn't die. Isn't that amazing that the worst conditions can bring out the best in us? I wouldn't be here if I, if I would have just gobbled up that bread. You and I want to form a human family that we hold hand in hand and we, we empower each other with our differences. Because there'll never be another Dimitri in a whole world, ever. There'll never be another you. Isn't that exciting? Many people can do what you can do, but not the way you can do that. You're unique, you're one of a kind, Dimitri. <laughs> Dimitri the Great. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That there were so many moments in your life, especially the war time, when you could have died. Um, so actually, you were about to meet death many, many times through time. What do you think of death in general? How is it now when you look at that? Yes, it, it happens to people someday. I'm going to be very happy in my deathbed that I was given the opportunity to do what I have done and I will never retire. <laughs> I, I welcome it and I will be very grateful that I was given an opportunity to hopefully do some good and I am a good guy. By the way, you dress very nicely. You, you dressed up for me, thank you. I, I I dress very nicely too because my father was a tailor and he told me I'll be the best dressed girl in town. So I do dress very well. And actually, uh, when I read this and I also checked the, some of your other interviews and I realized that I should uh, look good too while talking to you. <laughs> when I was liberated and you can see me on Oprah, I said that someone held my hand and I looked up and I saw a big lip and I never saw a big lip. And she looked up and she said, was he black? Yes. I saw tears in his eyes and M&M's candy in, in, in the palm. And I wish I could meet that man who really saved my life because I was already among the dead and I was liberated May 4, 1945 in Gunskirchen, Austria. And I was uh, actually given a book about Gunskirchen. And a couple of years ago, I was getting a phone call from Colorado asking me to come and lecture on post-romantic stress. And when I arrived, there was nothing but 71 on everywhere. And guess what? It's the home of the 71st infantry that liberated me. So things come around, you see, beautifully. There I was, Dr. Edith Eva Eager, <laughs> talking about thanking them for coming to get me. So they really should make TV series about you, really. It's not uh, flattering. I mean, there is a story to to be on screen. Oh, there's, that would be lovely. That there's, would be lovely. There's a movie in the works. Especially with my boyfriend. Yeah. Who told me I have beautiful eyes and beautiful hands, you know, and that's when I was in Auschwitz, I would come to everybody, tell me about my hands, tell me about my eyes, because that kept me going. Never give up, never ever give up. You can survive the worst conditions. 
I didn't get food for at least two weeks. And I'm here telling you that. But today, if I don't have a lunch, <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna die. It's not true. We are really women and men of strength. Mm -hmm. But to be sure that you little girl will never ever experience what I did. Mm -hmm. We want to do preventively everything we can to empower each other that I can be I and you can be you. Yeah. Because there'll never be another you. And that is very exciting to me to mm -hmm. let you know that this is the only time that you can interview someone like me and make some decisions that you're going to spread the word to form a human family. After everything you went through, do you believe in destiny? I believe in a free spirit. There is something that is already designed for us to live our lives the way we are. There is a God who made the decision for Edie to become a, a guide. I like to call myself a guide. From darkness to light, from prison to freedom. I like movement. I like movement that you are like a butterfly. We go through the metamorphosis and the shed the chrysalis so we can fly freely like a butterfly. But the butterfly doesn't fly right away. They rehearse at least 50 times. I studied that. So don't try to go from here to there. You go to, you're going to a tunnel and you can't go up or down. You gotta go through it. So suffering is feeling so don't medicate grief. It's not depression. It's grief. And you can't do anything with the past other than grieving, feeling, and healing. You can't heal what you don't feel. So cry. It's good. Because what comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. So see how you can recognize that crying is healing. You feel better when you have a good cry. It's okay to cry. And Russians know how to cry well. And how to dance well. <laughs> And how to do the Kozachki, and I used to do that. <laughs> I really did, believe me. I can still do the high kick. Yes, because I was a gymnast. Yes. So keep dancing and keep doing and knowing that in the evening, because one day is the whole life. There is something birth and death called life. So hope that you will not to drink too much vodka because alcohol, <laughs> the side effect is depression. Don't medicate your feelings if you can. Uh, I am kind of strong about that. Tell young people not to smoke pot because it uh, stops the natural way for the brain to grow until you're 25. Your brain mm -hmm. is not developed until you're 25 or 26. That is, of course, science. I didn't say that. So it's very important, again, how you get up in the morning and how you decide. Because I am at the evening part of my life and I'm thinking about how do I want to be remembered? And I want to be remembered that I did everything in my power to see to it that there never ever be another Auschwitz. One last question. What is happiness? How do you see happiness now? I think happiness is a very general word. 
I, I don't know who is happy. You know, people are starving, people are dying. I like to be a little more realistic rather than idealistic. Life is difficult. Look at your birth certificate. I don't think it says that uh, life is happy. I think they're going to tell you that uh, there is no guarantee, that there is no certainty, but there is probability. Like the way I view the world as an opportunity, the way I look at Auschwitz as an opportunity for me to discover the part in me that no Nazi could ever murder my spirit. That's what I bring you. So happy to me is kind of doesn't fit so well because I look what is going on. Life is not fair either. Little children are dying and, and other people are, who knows, they just look out what they can get from the world rather than what they can give to the world. And I'm one of those thinking, how can I make every day an opportunity? So when the evening time is now, I'm going to feel satisfied. Life is just one day. And you are kind of it's still in the morning or maybe, maybe Brunch. You, you, you're moving Brunch. towards. <laughs> You're moving towards your midlife. Yeah. I think you are a wonderful interviewer, and I'm very excited to be with you. And I wish I could really speak more Russian as well as I could. But I like to always put victims and victimizers together. I put the, the Nazis together with the, with the people who have survived and see how we can really truly form a world and get rid of the us and them mentality. That's my dream. Okay, I give my love to everyone. It's an honor. I really appreciate it with all of my heart and Absolutely. hope to see Absolutely. you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.